welcome to Watercolours with Caroline. This week we're going to paint an eggplant and an avocado, quite simple little paintings. I'm going to be working on four and a half inch by six inch, 140 pound Arsh cold press paper. And those people taking my Zoom class get the drawing and the notes. So welcome, let's get our paints ready and get stuck in. We're going to start with the avocado and I kind of hope that you've got it uh, all penciled in ready and that's why I send the the line drawing so you can have them ahead, done ahead of time. If you don't, while I'm sort of just getting started, um, see if you can pencil one in quickly and uh, you don't have to you don't have to put the writing in either. That's totally optional. Uh, I did mine with pen, but I'm going to sort of show you how you can do it with a paintbrush too, if you um, if you prefer to to do it with the paintbrush. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, so you can see a little bit clearer. Make sure it's still in focus. There we go. So with the avocado, we're going to start on dry paper, and then we're going to add along the edge a little bit of water because we want the, the paint to seep in and sort of give that soft edge on the inside of the pear, but that hard edge on the outside of the pear. So it's, it's a tricky little thing to do. And we also want to have ready, we want to have um, our inside colors ready for the pear before we sort of start doing all of that. Because once we put the water on here, we then want to add some very, very light, creamy colors to the inside. Now let me just, um, let me just grab my folder and I'm gonna grab my paintings here that I did before and my instructions as well. This, I typed my instructions last year, so, um, I need to make sure I, I, I've gone over them a few times since then, but I just need to make sure I have them here. So they're the same as yours. And um, we'll start with the avocado. So what we want to get ready before we paint is we want to get the um, creamy color inside of the pear ready first. And the reason we do that first is because if we do the dark green, if we mix the dark green paint first, our brush is going to have like lots of dark paint on, our water is going to have dark paint on, and we may get lots of dark paint in the light paint. So we're going to do the light paint first. We're just going to do it with raw sienna and a little bit of yellow and separately, not um, like not mixed. So I want to have a watery, I use azo yellow or azo yellow. You can use cadmium yellow, you can use permanent yellow, you can use any bright yellow that you have. You don't have to have the same one as me. It's got a little bit of that dirt down there. Not dirt, it's just dry dark paint. So there's my azo yellow and I'm adding quite a bit of water because I don't want it too bright. And in this one, I'm going to put the raw sienna. So a little bit of water in there first so I can get it moving and some raw sienna. And you'll notice that, you know, your paint water will get too dirty if we do the dark colors first. I want to qu add quite a bit of water to this raw sienna because I want it really, really light. I don't want it to be very strong. Now, the next thing I want to mix up before we start is the green that we're going to use, quite a dark green. And again, if you don't have the colors I have, I can suggest some alternatives. So I'm using um, sap green as my base. If you don't have sap green, you can use hooker's green, um, probably a permanent green, something that looks like this, like a, a just a regular sort of a green. And that's going to be my base for the dark color. Now I'm going to add to that some Prussian blue to darken it up a lot. Now, if you don't have Prussian blue, you can use a little bit of um, phthalo blue and a little bit of ultramarine if you don't have a Prussian blue. Or you could add a little bit of phthalo blue and a little bit of Payne's gray. It just depends what you have. What you're trying to do 
is get this green mix darker. And then I'm going to add a little bit of burnt sienna because we, we don't want it really, really bright like this. We want it a little bit more um, organic looking. So I'm going to get a little bit of burnt sienna and mix that into that green that I've mixed to take it down to a more organic sort of green. And do it slowly, a little bit at a time, until I get a green that I feel is sort of like that dark green on an avocado. So take your time. Don't be afraid to add, you know, enough paint to get a good color. And I want to wash my brush because I'm going to, um, I'm going to need a nice clean brush for when I do the wet part. So I've got my colors ready. And I'm going to put my this just to one side. And I have a Kleenex. I always have a Kleenex handy because anytime you get a drip of paint or a drip of water or anything happening, it's good to be able to just really quickly um, dab it up the Kleenex. Don't like using paper towel because it's too hard and it can sometimes leave um, a harsh pattern on your paper, whereas the Kleenex is soft and it will pick up any mess really quickly. So I'm going to switch to a slightly smaller brush. I don't want it too small, but this is number six. A uh, nice point on the brush and take that lovely dark color. Now I didn't wet my brush because I didn't want to add any more water to the mix. If I wet my brush, I'd be adding a lot more water to this mix. But what I am doing is gently rolling my brush in this nice wet paint mix so that it's really full of paint. I don't want I don't want to just like tip the tip in it and get a little bit on there. I want to get it nicely full of paint. Uh, so I have plenty for when I'm painting this pair. I'm going to start right at the top here. And again, your paint, if it's correctly mixed, should stand up away from your paper and be shiny. And of course, we want the edge to be nice and dark. So I'm going to take that down with the point of my brush and take it down this side of the, the pair. And if, you, if you're using the point of the brush, you can get a lovely, usually a lovely sharp line and take it down up here. Now I did that side first because it's on the left side. I'm right hand dominant and I don't want to like get my hand in the paint. I'm very good at getting my hand in the paint. And then we're going to take it down. There's an inside and an outside line to this side of the pair. And I want to do the inside line first. I can put the outside line on any time, but the inside where we get that bleeding from the pear skin is important. I'm going to put that on. Now, mine is still shiny and standing up away from the paper, so I know it's still fairly wet. It's starting to go matte right here, so it's soaking in, and I don't want it to be too dry. If, if it's too dry, we're not going to get the next effect. Now, I'm not going to use this brush that has paint on. I'm going to switch to, um, this is my number uh, four brush, and I'm going to wet it with nice clean water. And I'm going to gently run it just along the edge of that wet paint. And every so often, I'm, I've got a sponge here and put it there where you can see it. Every so often I'm tapping my brush on the sponge so I don't have too much water going down that edge. I have to do it very, very gently. I'm going to wash my brush now because I don't want to be dragging too much paint down that edge. I want, I want it to be clean water and I'm tapping it again so there's not too much water on there. Tapped it off too much, got not enough. So I'm just going to go back with a little bit more clean water. And sometimes it will bleed in and sometimes it won't. Sometimes it will be too dry and it, and it won't. That's okay because on your pair, on a real pair, sometimes you see that staining from the skin and sometimes you don't. So it doesn't matter if some is too dry and it doesn't bleed in. I want to get this side before it dries. If you take too long, it will dry. Mine's starting to dry. but it's okay, it will bring a bit of staining. And I can see this is very wet down here. So I know that when I touch this, 
I should get a good amount of bleeding into the to the water. Now, what's going to happen if we don't put the light color on now, we're going to get a strong edge around this wet area that is going to show up as just a strong line, which we don't want. We don't want to have a strong line where we've put that water. So I'm going to get my, um, I'm going to go back to my bigger brush, clean bigger brush, number eight. And I'm going to get the raw sienna on my brush. And I did wet my brush first because I want this to be nice and light. So before my line dries, and I'm going to get some of the yellow on my brush, that really thin yellow mix I made. Now you want to keep your pit in the center nice and dry. Don't go over that. And I'm going to take this around the whole pair. Zoom in a little bit more. And if at some point this looks too dry on the edge, I can take it back to the wet line that we just put in. I have a little bit of a drip coming down into my pit here. That's not going to matter. It's just a tiny drip. And we'll fill that up. If you have some mist spaces like here, don't worry about the mist spaces in watercolor are really quite attractive. And it doesn't matter if you have them. I'm going to get a little, now it's all wet now. I can play a little bit with the, with the color. I've got a, just a little bit more raw sienna on my brush. And if I just touch, if I just touch that raw sienna on, onto this wet area, it will just blend in. And I just want to have a little bit more shadow here and a little bit more here, just, just a touch. It's not actually painting with your paintbrush. It's kind of touching the wet paper with the tip of your brush. And one more place. I'm going to get some more Rossian. Just right here where the uh, pear was attached to the stem, I just put some stronger raw sienna just there, just as that where there's maybe a staining from the stem. This is um, bled in quite a lot here. I'm not going to worry about that. That's the whole beauty and joy of watercolor. So I, I have at the moment three brushes in my hand. There's the one with the green on, the one with the water on, and then the one with a bit of sort of raw sienna mix. I'm going to go back to the green one. I have to kind of remember which is which. It doesn't matter if you forget. You can wash them out and uh, redo. So I am going to wash that brush out because I don't want it as strong. The edge of the pear, I'm going to add a little bit of water to the edge of this pear color and just tease a little bit of that color out so that it's not as strong. And I will put the edge on the pear where you can see the other side of the pear. As I come down towards the, the base of the pear, I'm getting a stronger color. So I come down here, it's a little bit stronger. And I'm just using the very point of my brush. And the nice thing is if you have lots and lots of paint in what's called the belly of your brush, this thick part here, and you lift your brush up, the paint will flow down like a, a pen into the tip of your brush so that you can get a nice amount of paint coming out of the tip, but you're not getting a big thick glob of paint happening here. I'm going to take that down. And this is the point where we just want to leave this one to soak in and move on to the eggplant while this is settling in. And, and all this nice paint here that we've put on is, is um, really getting into the tooth of the paper. So we get good color. And I'll put that to one side. At the moment, anytime you have a painting at this stage, it doesn't look like much. You have to really wait till you've got a lot of that painting in there before it looks like something. I'll move that over to one side and um, get grab my eggplant one. So here we have the eggplant and I'll go back to my picture. The eggplant. 
on the eggplant, the two hard highlights so this one and this one that's where we leave a hard dry edge and don't smush it in with water or anything and i actually draw mine so that i can remember to leave them uh, unpainted otherwise they tend to get painted in very quickly the soft highlight is going to be here and we're going to do that like we did the eggs last week where we wet this part with some water and kind of just let the paint bleed in and we can use our thirsty brush to soak up the paint there if it gets out of control the other thing that i've done here is i've put a splodge of ultramarine blue here and a bit more magenta here so that i've got a big variety of color in this eggplant. And I am not worried about all these kind of uh, hard, dry edges that form. I'm using those as just part of the watercolor look. And when you look at the whole finished painting, you tend not to actually zero in on any of these kind of hard edges. You just see the whole look of it. And down here on the second layer where I put this hard, dark shadow in here on that layer, I put water underneath and I let it bleed down into the water to make the shadow. And then I've put a complementary color. Complementary color to violet is yellow. So I've used a sort of raw sienna and yellow green mix here to have a complement to the shadow so that it's it, that is bleeding back into the, the violet. So it gives a kind of an interesting watercolor look. It's not realistic. It is your kind of watercolor um, impressionistic look. And I never worry if I got a, a splot of paint. I don't worry about that. Same thing here. We're using, uh, it have to be dry here. We're using the complementary color, the yellow against the purple to really make this stand out, the raw sienna and then the sap green. And I did the lettering with a pen. Again, you you can use a pen if you have one, or you can use a paintbrush, or you can leave it out entirely. That's up to you. So we need to make we need to make the mixtures that we will be using for the eggplant. So my base color is one called dioxazine violet, and I think we use that um, in week one with the flowers. Now, if you don't have dioxazine violet, you can mix one. I'm just going to zoom back a little bit, a little bit close there. There we go. You can mix one using um, my favorite mix for a dioxazine violet color is quinacridone magenta. But if you don't have that, you can use <clears throat> quinacridone rose or permanent rose. Either of those are similar. I'll put permanent rose beside it. So anytime I'm using magenta in this, you can use a permanent rose or you can use a quinacridone rose. Or if you don't have either of those, your third choice is alizarin crimson, which is not quite so magenta-ish, but it's kind of like claret and it's, it's okay. It'll work just fine. But magenta is your best color. And if you mix that with phthalo blue, it's got some phthalo blue here, either the rose or the magenta with phthalo blue, you get a lovely color that's almost the same as the dioxazine violet. My violet's very dry here. I got to uh, wet it up a bit. So it's very, very similar. If I add a little bit more blue to it, it becomes even more similar. So if you're looking at that, I bet you can barely tell the difference between the mix and the dioxazine violet. So you go with what you've got. It's easier if you've just got the violet to pick it up, of course. As well as that, we're going to use magenta on its own. Or like I say, if you don't have magenta on its own, use rose, permanent rose, quinacridone rose, a color that has rose in the title. Or if you don't have those, alizarin crimson. They are all a cool red color that will work well with violets and other colors. And we also want... I have to make a little clean patch just here. We need some ultramarine blue. I'll dry that off a bit. On its own as well. So some ultramarine blue on its own. Okay. 
I need to have our colors ready. And I also have a, a nice dark mix. I've mixed the ultramarine blue, the violet, and the magenta. So I'm going to go back to this. This is just my dioxazine violet by itself. I'm going to mix it with some ultramarine blue and some magenta to get a really intense eggplant color. And like I say, if you don't have the magenta, go with the crimson or the rose color. That will, that will work beautifully too. I want that to be really, really deep, a little bit more blue. And I'll, I'm going to have some alizarin crimson here because I might just add some to mine just for a different look to this one, to the one I did previously. I have all those colors uh, mixed up ready. And we're going to do how we did with the egg last week. We're going to wet this little bit first before we start. Just, just this little bit, nothing else. We're going to just wet that so that a clean water, I've got quite a few pots of clean water here. Clean water, whoops, and now I've dripped water all over it. That's why you have your Kleenex. If you drip water where you don't want it, dab it up quick before you start. So I'm going to put just here, I'm going to put the water to get the soft highlight here before I start painting. And I don't want it to get too close to this hard edge. I want this one to be hard. Now, just like the flower, we're gonna sort of start where it's going to be darkest. I'm gonna to switch to a slightly smaller brush, number six. Get my paint a little bit closer. And I'm gonna start with my mix that I made, my nice dark mix. And I really need these leaves to be dry to get in here, to go under them and get that lovely sharp edge. So I want to start here. So I can go point of the brush again. I filled my brush with paint and I'm gonna go under that, that leaf area, making sure I poke the point of my brush <clears throat> in under here to get that lovely sharp shape. And don't forget, this is why I draw the highlights on. Don't forget to paint around that highlight carefully. Coming down your eggplant. Now, if your paint is wet enough, you're not gonna have any trouble. That's why you need to have good wet paint so you can get all this paint in before anything starts to dry. I'm gonna switch it up a little bit at this point and I'm gonna go into, I'm not gonna wash my brush at all. I'm just gonna go into my magenta mix with my brush that already has violet on it because I don't want to add any water at this point. And I'm gonna bring that just magenta down to the water I've got here. I'm gonna to go to ultramarine blue. I am gonna wash my brush at this point, dry it off a little bit, get my ultramarine blue. And I want to put some ultramarine blue just here, just a splash, not too much. Dry my brush again. I mean, wash my brush again, sorry. Did want that part clean. Go back to, I'm going back now to my mix. And I'm going to bring it nice and dark around the bottom of the eggplant. Meet the blue. Meet the blue up here. I want to meet the blue before it dries. I can meet it at the edge of that highlight because it's dry. And just, I'm going to, I just dipped into my magenta mix again because I want them to mix wet in wet as I'm working. And I've got to go back up here. I'm going up with my magenta mix because I can see it starting to dry there. And if anything starts to dry before I get the rest of the paint on, I'm going to get a, a really weird edge to it. Back into my magenta and carefully. Get that nice hard edge at the bottom and lots of paint. Now, my highlight may need a little bit of help. And what's happened right here too, my paint's too dry here and then wet. But I'm going to put a second shadow on that and not worry about that. And that's that's watercolor for you, does stuff like that. What I am going to do here is use the thirsty brush, which means get my brush really clean and just take a little of the water off on my towel and I can just, with that thirsty brush, I, I pull a little bit of paint, wipe it on my towel, pull a little bit of paint, wipe it on my towel and just 
gently ease this highlight back, but don't do this too much or you're going to get um, what I had happening here, which is a wet edge against a dry edge, which is not, not good, but it doesn't matter. I don't mind that because this whole thing is going to have uh, wet and dry edges on it and, and um, bleeding edges and things that I'm not, uh, I'll put in another shadow here. And part of that is you need to work pretty fast getting the color on so you don't have this happening where one's drying and one's wetter. And it's very hard to do. You need to really be concentrating and spring a little bit more color along the edge. You can see from my light that wherever it is shiny, the paint is still wet. I don't even know if my light's too, no, I don't think my light is too bright. You need it bright enough that you can see what I'm doing. And you can see up here, it's very dull. And if I'd have had my paint a little bit wetter here, I wouldn't have had a problem. Look how, <clears throat> also look how as time goes on, great demonstration of, of um, a problem you can have wet in wet. As time goes on and this dries more and this is still wet, the paint creeps towards that edge and forms an even darker edge here. So anytime you, <clears throat> you want that effect, it's a great way to get that effect if you want um, kind of a, a frilly edge there. Let's see, we've got that one done. This is a great point to put this one aside <clears throat> and work on the avocado again. I have my avocado pear nice and dry. And the stone in the middle of the pear, we're going to do exactly like the eggs last week, where we're going to wet the highlight and then I'm going to put a base color of raw sienna on first. So if we look at the stone in the pear here, this is the wet area right here. And then I'm putting raw sienna on as a base. And then I'm going to be adding, while that's wet, I'm going to be adding a burnt sienna and Prussian blue dark mix here. And then a little bit of burnt sienna again. You can see the dry edges. That doesn't matter. That's part of watercolor having the hard and soft edges, the, the dry and, and wet and wet effects. But the first thing I want to do, I have, I have raw sienna from my first wash that I did with the avocado, but I want to add a little bit more to that. And we're also going to be using burnt sienna. So I want to get some burnt sienna as well, ready for the, the dark part of the stone in the pear. So just I want pure burnt sienna here. And then I'm going to do a mix. Now I have an old mix here of ultramarine and violet. I'm just going to wet that up and use that. And uh, for my dark, very dark mix, I've used ultramarine, burnt sienna and Prussian blue. So into that old mix, I'm putting a bit of Prussian blue. I'm putting a little bit of uh, ultramarine. And then I'll put some burnt sienna in there to get that really dark, dark brown. A little bit more ultramarine, a little bit more burnt sienna. I want to get that dark, dark brown for the shadow on the stone. And this is just the burnt sienna. So I've got my three colors here ready for the next stone. Move that over. And I want to start with clean water. I have my number six brush. Don't want one that's too big because our paper's four and a half by six and our stone's not that big. And the highlight on the stone is right here. So I'm going to just wet that up with some clear water. And I'm just going to start with the raw sienna. And just like with the egg, we're going to just bring it to the edge of that water that I put on there. So that we keep the soft highlight. Again, just painting with the very point of my brush. I have a little drip of water on there. I have to 
make sure I get rid of that so it doesn't flow over from the stone into that. Now I want to bring a little bit more raw sienna in here. Not, I don't want it quite as white as I had it. And I want to now go into the burnt sienna before this is too dry. I don't want it to dry too much. And I want to put some burnt sienna around the edge here. And we possibly will have to do this in a couple of layers and that's fine too. And I'm gonna go into my really, really dark mix that I made, the one with the, the dark one here with the Prussian blue and the ultramarine. And while this is still wet again, this is where you don't paint, you, you touch with the tip of your brush. I'm just gonna to touch that around this edge and down here. And it's going to give a sort of a three-dimensional look at the, that's, that will make the stone look like it's curving out. I am using my thirsty brush. I'll clean that brush, dry it off a little bit. And I just want to just push that very gently with my thirsty brush, just very gently to get it to blend in a little bit more. Now, I will probably, or you will probably want to do even a third darker shadow when this is dry because it will dry quite a bit lighter and your dark color will blend into your light color quite a bit. And if at any point you're, you've completely lost this highlight, use your thirsty brush, which is clean, fairly dry, and just push it back a little bit if you've lost that highlight. Because, you know, like use your brush, just push back just a little bit. And there is another method if you lose it completely. I'll just move this and bring my one that I painted uh, last year over. If you lose it completely, you can actually uh, get some of the highlight back by scrubbing out. I have a little brush. You can use any small brush to scrub out and use clean water and a clean Kleenex. And you can, after the paint is dry, you can scrub with some clean water and dab with the Kleenex and pull back some highlights if you, if you lose a highlight and your paints are not too staining. Now, I, didn't, I tend not to use staining colors very often. The Thalo Blue will stain and the Prussian Blue will stain a little bit, but the Burnt Sienna and the Ultramarine Blue don't. So they will wash back a bit and give you a highlight again, but the paint has to be perfectly dry before you do that. You can't do it um, when the paint's damp or when it's wet and you will um, damage your paper if you do that. But this is, this is a good one for the end if you've lost some highlights. I don't want to do it too much because this is, you know, this is okay. But just to let you know, any little brush like this will do if you just buy a tiny little uh, brush for acrylic paintings is a quite a firm tip uh, not too long you can um, brush stuff back and think about what else we need to do on the pair after we've done the the stone here well we can do a little bit of the shadow because this is all dry down here and it's a good time when it's dry and this is waiting for this to dry. You can put the shadow in underneath. So my one here is sort of a little bit of lilac and a little bit of ultramarine blue, which is just the mixture that we had over there for the eggplant. And I've also used a little bit of raw sienna and a little bit of pale rose to sort of pull that out of there. We don't have any rose mixed up. And I need to add a bit more water to my raw sienna. So I need to get that ready. So I'm going to water up my raw sienna a bit so it's not quite so strong again. And a bit more watery. Clean a little bit of space here for some rose. And if you don't have permanent rose, you can use rose madder. 
quinacridone rose. Um, some plants are just called rose. And if you don't have any of those, alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is a little bit dark. I'll show you the difference. Not too different, but rose is um, a little more gentle. So I want some of that, but definitely not too strong. Not too strong. And then I have the purple mix already. So I'm going to, to do that shadow. I'm not going to worry about the words for a moment. I'm just act as if they're not there. I'm going to wet just under the pear. And the first thing I'm going to put in there is the ultramarine blue and violet uh, mix that I have. It won't be too dark because it will be flowing into that water I just put on there. And i got to make sure that I don't go over the dry edge of the pear. I'm using quite a big brush for this um, at number 10. I don't want to get too, um, I want to stay loose is what I want, want to say. So I'm, I'm taking a little bit of that raw sienna, which is a complement of the violet. So it works really well up against it. And then a little tiny bit of the rose, sort of on the edge here. The rose, of course, being the pink, is a complement to the green. So it works really well with your, I'm, I'm going a little bit of that very watery raw sienna on my brush again, and just tapping it into that rose color. Take a little bit more rose here, maybe. I'm staying very, very loose. That's why I have a number 10 brush. I don't want this to be uh, have any real kind of shape to it. And I'm going to get a little bit of ultramarine blue watered right, right down, watered down that ultramarine blue. I'm just going to tap a little bit under here. I want a really wet and wet look happening here. I'm tapping a little bit of that ultramarine blue in there. And it's all going to mix wet in wet on your paper. And it's never going to do the same thing twice. It, it's, I'm never going to get it to look like this one a second time. And if I did this again, I wouldn't be able to get it to look like this one. It, it's just wet in wet doing its own thing. And the more free that you can be with that, the better. And to be free, use a much bigger brush. It'll help like keep your colors a little bit diluted. They're not strong. I mean, if I go back to my palette and we look at the, the raw sienna I'm using and the rose, that is not a strong mix. And I, the bit of ultramarine that I had, I delight, diluted it out so it wasn't so strong again. And the same with the violet mix. Try and keep them nice and loose. So we're, we're basically now we've done the shadow under here. We haven't got too many things to work on on the pair. While, this, while the top is actually fairly dry, when it is dry, I'm going to get my number four brush and the green paint again. I'm going to add a little bit more burnt sienna to the green paint. Darken it up a little bit. I just want to darken up this area here where the um, where the pear was attached to the stem and maybe add a little bit of extra line to the sum of the outside of the pear. Not, I'm not like drawing around it in one, one thick line. I'm just adding here and there a little bit of definition to the edge. Be careful. If you get down here and you do it, it's going to flood out into your shadow. I will show you what will happen if you go down here with your green. It will do this. So depending on whether you want that look or not, be careful if you're doing a little bit of extra green. If you do go down here, you will get that happening. Do I mind about that? No, because if you do have something green, 
standing on a surface, you will re- get some of that green reflected in the shadow. But it is it is a little tricky. So, you know, only do it if you're really sure, really sure that you want that effect in your shadow. But you can see as because I had the dark line on underneath the dry one, as it's pulling away into the water, it's lightning. So you can still see that dark line of the edge, and this will kind of look like a reflection of the green pear. So I don't mind that at all, but I do want to caution. It's it's a tricky thing to do. So, and if it happens accidentally, just leave it. Just leave it. Don't worry about it. So what I want to do is put this aside and we'll work on a little bit more shading on this when, when the pit is dry. And when the shadow's dry, we'll work on a little bit more texture and shading on the side of the pair. But we won't worry about that for now. We'll let this all soak in. And we'll come back to this one. Look at how that lovely bloom is shaping up. It's not quite dry yet, but it really, the pigment really flows into that area as the two dry at different rates. It's actually a great example of, of um, how to do it wrong. And I'm going to pause for I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm going to mute for a minute because I want to make sure this is perfectly dry with my hair dryer. Oh, some. I have dried mine, so it's good and dry. I'm gonna do a little bit, little bit of fixing on this edge. And then we're going to put a darker shadow under here, and then the the wet under here and the raw sienna and sort of bit of green, <clears throat> excuse me, here to do this shadow. So the shadows are very loose on these two and very kind of wet and wet. So I'm going to see if I can do a little bit of fixing on this edge here. I'm going back to my palette that has my purples and, and magentas in. And I need a, I'm going back to, let me see what brush I'm going to pick up. That's number eight. Number eight's a really good size brush. And I will mix up. This is my mix that's de-violet, dioxazine violet, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of magenta. I'm going to add a little bit more magenta to it, make it a bit more eggplanty color. And I'm going to see what I can do with this edge. To kind of disguise my uh, back run that happened there. And I've put that on now. This is tricky. I've got a damp brush again. I've dampened off my brush and I'm just going to pull it along that edge so it's less, um, less hard, a less distinct edge. I've got some, oh, just gone in. I've got a bit of ultramarine blue as well. Ultramarine blue is a great color for darkening second layers. And I'm going to put a bit of ultramarine blue up here under these leaves to get shadow under there. And I'm not going to, I'm not really going to worry about um, hard edge there. I'm just going to kind of leave that. And I'm not going to worry about hard edge underneath either. I'm going to get the ultramarine blue. And then the dioxazine violet mix. I'm going to take a, a nice kind of shadow under here. I am going to soften this bit a little bit with a damp brush. Take that shadow up here. Um, while this is still wet, this paint, I've got just a wet brush, some clean water. And I'm going to take that under here. and let that bleed out into the water. And then I want to, I'm going over here to my raw sienna again. So some raw sienna here. I'm gonna grab a little bit of that avocado green color, mix it in with that raw sienna and a little bit of my yellow, tiny bit of my yellow. I've got a really um, greeny 
raw sienery mix. Too dark there. I'm gonna wash my brush and I'm gonna take that out with a bigger brush. I put a little bit too much raw sienna on there, so I'm just gonna scoop that up and go back into my greeny raw sienna add on. And I'm thinking right under this eggplant, I want a bit more, a bit more violet color. I'm just tipping that in with the tip of my brush under there into the wet and letting it blend into those colors. I don't have a very smooth edge here, but this paint is just slightly damp now and I'll be tempting fate to do anything to that edge while this paint's slightly damp. If I want to get a smoother edge there, I need to wait till this is completely dry and then just go over that edge and smooth it out a little bit. Don't, don't, and also don't be tempted to do too much to make this happen under here. Leave it alone and let whatever it wants to do, whatever's going to happen, just let it happen on its own. And don't try and keep encouraging it. Like don't try and keep like painting these colors in together because it you'll just you'll take away anything that's happening there. You'll stop it from happening. And you'll end up with all the colors kind of blended together and no interesting blends on the paper. And, it, and like I said, it's never going to do the same thing twice. Oh, we've got both our paintings right now at a point where they need to be dried before we go on. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to dry this part definitely here so we can work on the leaves at the top of this eggplant. And while I have the hairdryer out, I'm going to dry this one completely so that I can put a little bit more shadow on the stone of the avocado to make it even more dark around the edge and give it a, a cleaner edge too. So again, I'm going to pause and I'm going to mute so I can do some drying and you can be painting and catching up while I'm doing that. Well, now that my eggplant is dry, I want to work on the stem here. And we're gonna have some different colors on the stem. Right here, it's going to be a bright yellow. Here, it's going to be a raw sienna. And then the rest of it is going to be painted with, say, a sap green, or um, you can modify the green that we had for the pear. So I've got the green I had for the pear here, and I don't need to do too much to it. Wet it up again, pull a little bit back, and I have some sap green here. I'm going to add a bit more sap green to it and a little bit more ultramarine blue to it maybe. And that's good enough for doing the leaves of this. The other color I want ready is uh, just some raw sienna. I'm cleaning a spot here just so my colors are nice and pure. And clean water, of course. Grab some clean water. Now again, I need some, a little bit of raw sienna, nice clean raw sienna. And a little bit of the yellow. I really against the against the sort of deep purple of the eggplant. I really want to see that nice bright yellow. It's a really good thing to keep in mind whenever you're planning a painting is to say, what are my complementary colors? in this painting. What's my main color here? The main color here is a deep violet color. So the complement of deep violet is a, a bright yellow. So any of the yellows are going to be great with it. Like the raw sienna is kind of a earthy yellow and my azo yellow is a nice bright yellow. So both of them are going to work well and you don't need to have much of it to kind of make your painting pop a little bit. So I've got I've got the yellow on this brush. So I don't want to wash it off. It's just a waste of a little bit of paint. So I've got my other brush here, my number four, 
I'm going to get the raw sienna on the number four brush. And I want to have a little touch of that at the top of the stalk here, the raw sienna, and maybe coming down in the stalk. And I want to have this, this leaf coming out here. And of course, the plant has probably been picked for a few days. And when you have something from the grocery store that's been picked for a few days, they kept it cold, the leaves and everything start to dry out. So you would have that kind of look to it. Now switching to my yellow brush that already had yellow on. And I'm going to make sure that I get the lovely bright yellow coming along this leaf. It doesn't matter if it blends into that raw sienna at the top. That's fine. And you can see why it has to be perfectly dry because if this was not perfectly dry, you'd be getting the yellow and the purple mixing, making a gray color. It would, it would look awful. I clean my brush out now. I think I'm going back to my number four brush. And clean that and pick up. Make sure you can see what I'm picking up here. I'm going to pick up that green color for the rest of the the leaf. And I want to make sure that here my yellow and my raw sienna are still wet so I can have some wet in wet happening. And make sure that your green is not too, too wet. Otherwise, you're going to lose your yellow. If that happens, if any, if your yellow gets overtaken, thirsty brush again. My brush is clean and dried off, just drying it on my sponge. And I'm just pulling back that green a little bit. It was a little bit wetter than the yellow that I had on there. So it's going to flow into the yellow. I'll work over here and avoid that area for a moment. Probably yellow was a little bit too wet to do that. It's all a, it's all a judgment all the time, like how much water do I mix with my paint? How wet is my paint right now as I work on it? What's going to happen? I can have a little bit more of that green going down there. It's still, my raw sienna is still wet up the top here, but I can tape my green up there and they should blend nicely wet and wet. The other thing I'm feeling here is I feel like my shadow color is just a little bit light. And I'm feeling like I might want a little bit more shadow color down there. But I'm keeping a close eye on this green, which is creeping down this leaf. I want to encourage it to go back a little bit. I don't mind it creeping. Like if you look at the one I did before, the green is definitely creeping down there. But I want to make sure but right against that violet, I've got a nice, a nice bright yellow. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that green. I want just a little bit more of something down here. In my other one, I've got a, I've got kind of a second layer of something here. I don't know what actually, but I think I'm going to take that green, and I think I'm, I'm going to. Well, I know what I've got here. I've got some ultramarine blue over here. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of that green with that ultramarine blue, get an ultramarine bluey green. And I think I might use that to put in a little bit more shadow under here. And I just feel like it needs just a little bit more. And I kind of want to have the green echoing here somewhere. And it's, it's really nice to layer, like it's nice to have a layer over the top. And I don't want I don't want a clean edge to my layering either. I'm going to wet it a little bit and have a kind of a ragged edge to that and just wetted it. Just see how that just gave it a little bit more depth. And it also pulled some of that green down into the shadow. Take a little bit more of that green. I like playing with the, the shadow colors. I'm just taking a little bit across here too. I like to have reflections of a color that you've used somewhere in the painting somewhere else so that it kind of has some balance. You don't just have an isolated color somewhere. Now this one, 
All I need now is to clean up. I, I've got a bit of a ragged edge along here, and I kind of would like to clean that up a little bit. Uh, it's a tricky thing to do because I've got most of that eggplant painted, and I don't know if I can get a clean edge, but I can try. Take the point of my brush, and go out a little bit, smooth that line. Want some nice intense color there. I'm wondering if I actually come down and, and want to go into that. I want to dangerously go into that wet area I've got here, deliberately and dangerously. But I gotta remember, like this yellow is wet or damp. I don't want to go, I don't want to go near that at all. So I've got it, I just wet clean dried off my brush a little bit and just don't touch this yellow i'm just going to sort of soften that shadow in that i just put and see how i just cleaned up that edge by carefully going over it with a darker mix and then softening it in a little bit with my damp brush and just touching this shadow that was still wet with a little bit of that color so it, it seeped into that second layer that I put on there. Those are just little nuances that give your painting that sort of watercolor look, that interesting look to it. I'm, I The other thing I don't like is I don't like this pointy bit here, but I'm not going to fix it right now. When this ed edge is dried that I've cleaned up, I'm going to put a very pale wash of something just there to stop it being quite so pointy. If you look at this one, it's similar, but it's not quite such a deep angle there. It, it comes across more, and I just I just feel like this angle's a little bit too steep, and when this is dry, I just want to put a little bit of something there. Um, the other thing I want to do is on this avocado, I want to, again, the shadow underneath, now that it's dry, I feel is a little bit too light. So I want to put some of that uh, lilac underneath, but I'm, I don't want to do it on dry paper. I want to wet very carefully under the pear. I don't want to wet the pear at all and uh, get a little bit of that lilac and add a little bit of ultramarine blue in with it and put a bit more a little bit more shadow underneath there really carefully i remember last week i didn't use any violet remember i said Violet's lovely for shadows, but it's not in our palette. Well, we're, Violet was in our palette today, so we're going to use it and use it for some shading. I'm just teasing that out a little bit with my with my brush. And of course, we have the ultramarine blue in the shadow too, and the pink and the and the uh, raw sienna. So we've got a lot of colors going on there. Now, I need some darker colors around the edge of the stone. If you look at this one, it's pretty dark around here and uh, sharpen it up a little bit. So let's go back to our mix. I've got my mix over here, which is drying up a little bit. Our mix was, um, I have to think about that again. Our mix was, just gotta go back to make sure. The stone mix was ultramarine, Moo, burnt sienna and Prussian. Burnt Sienna. Yeah, so Ultramarine Blue, Burnt Sienna, and Prussian Blue. I'm going to wet that up again. Make sure I've got some good color. So Ultramarine Blue first, and then some Burnt Sienna. Lots of Burnt Sienna, and then a tiny bit of Prussian Blue. Prussian Blue is a cool blue. And burnt sienna is uh, not burnt sienna. Well, burnt sienna is warm, but ultramarine blue is a warm blue. So to get the shadows cooler and darker, the Prussian blue just gets them a bit cooler than the ultramarine. But the ultramarine is good in there with the burnt sienna. 
I've got a nice dark mix. And now I want to loads on my brush. Too much on my brush. I'm just taking a bit off. I want to clean up that edge, like make it a bit rounder. Using just the point of my brush and darken that edge too. I have to be really careful. This is the slow, slow point here. Slow down. Be really careful with the tip of my brush going around this edge. Darken it up. And you don't have to go all the way around. It's really nice if you leave a space where you don't paint. Ah. Another color I have in my original one is a little bit of purple in this shadow. So I'm switching. I've cleaned my brush and I'm switching to a little bit of my purple here, just right here, going under the stone. And then I'm going to switch to just pure burnt sienna. Pure burnt sienna on my brush now to go along that edge here. Really, really darkened up that edge. And I'm going to have a wet, clean brush and just gently, very gently, just agitate that in so it's a bit more of a soft, bit more of a soft edge along here. It will look, when you have your wet paint going onto your dry paint, it looks um, like it's not going to blend in. And it's, you kind of think, oh, I don't know, that, that looks a bit odd, the dry paint on the wet paint. But you have to wait. You have to wait for the the dry paint to the wet paint rather to dry and for the two to sort of meld together and then you get a better idea of what it's going to look like. So don't be tempted to do too much uh, blending with your brush because they haven't they, your paint hasn't dried yet and it hasn't blended into your underneath layer. I'm just doing a little bit of blending and it. It also looks really odd to you when you're close up, but when you when you go back, when the paint's dry, it looks three dimensional. It looks okay, it's particularly when the paint's dry. I'm just going to take that back a little bit. I'll zoom back in again. Put a little. I just want to put a little. At the top of this area here, I just want to put a little cap of burnt sienna, just like that. Just, again, to echo those colors back and forth in the painting. And I even left a little space between the green and the little cap of burnt sienna there. Another thing you might like to do is a bit more, a bit more uh, color on the outside of the pear, especially down at the base of the pear here where it's going away from the light. And I'm gonna mix, take my mixing tray over here. I'm gonna mix some of my burnt sienna, I've got some burnt sienna here, and mix it with my green to darken up and brown up my green a little bit. And you, you know what an avocado looks like on the skin. It's, it has bumps, it's a bumpy kind of a skin. So you can actually add that texture with the tip of your brush and it's, it makes it a more natural color, adding a little bit of that burnt sienna into the green to sort of add that little bit of bumpy texture that you have on the skin. I'm wiggling the tip of my brush in and out. And down here at the, at the base, no, no texture, just, just shadow down here. A little bit of a line, putting a little bit of a line on the, the outside edge, not everywhere again, just here and there. 
to give it uh, an edge. All right, how are we doing? We're doing pretty well. These are just short little uh, paintings. And the only thing really left to do is to decide if you want to do the calligraphy on them and whether you want to do the calligraphy. If you are a calligrapher, and I know some of you that take my classes are, you want to get your pen out and do that, I'm sure. But if you're not a calligrapher, you can trace my letters and you can do them with brush. So either one, I'm going to get a pen ready and show you both how to do that. Because if you're, if you're not into calligraphy, then the brush is fine. But if you kind of want to learn it or it's interesting to you, I can show you how to do the calligraphy with a pen too. So I'm just going to pause a minute, get my pens ready. And the reason to do it on some scrap paper first is to really just like get your pen going, deal with all these splats and things and, and get a feel for it. And then once you've got everything working well, you can go ahead and do it on your good paper. Now I want two colors in there. So I'm switching now to the green and get some green on my pen. Poke it in the edge here. And it really just has to be the right consistency. That's why you need to kind of practice first. And I have green on there now, and I'm just going to touch, just touch the green into that wet raw sienna mix, and they're going to blend wet in wet on the paper and give you a sort of a double color. And it, re it really is just a case of getting the pen going to get this to work. Once the pen's going and you have the paint consistency right, it gets easier and easier. So you need to kind of have a little practice sheet ahead of time. You can see as, as my pen's getting going now, I've got my mix just right. It's starting to get easier. You have to push quite hard on the dip pens to get them to release the paint. But this is just watercolor paint. I'll we'll switch back to my and I get I get a, a cheap cheapish kind of a brush that's quite you know quite um, firm. This is from the dollar store, this one, and load my my pen with the brush. And I'm switching now to the raw sienna mix. And you can really see that now my, my mix is good and my pen is running well. I got it going. It works really well on the on the watercolor paper. Watercolor paper is great for it because it doesn't, if it's good watercolor paper, like this is Ash 140 pound, it doesn't bleed out or anything. It just stays where you put it. Whereas some cheap papers, all of this will just kind of bleed and feather into the paper. So that's one way to do it. You can change colors. You can just tip the other color to the paint that you've put on there and just change the color by just, just touching the pen onto it like that. Or you can do this with a paintbrush filling in the letters that I've shown you. Now, when I did the eggplant, I used a different nib. I used what's called a copper plate nib which is a little bit different. Oh, mine is a ter in a terrible state. It's all bent pieces here. Let's see if this one's better. There we go. So this again is the same um, paint that we just used for the eggplant. I was painting it onto the back of the nib and using the paint to do the calligraphy. And it takes a bit of getting used to 
you have to kind of again get the the nib running the paint consistency just right to get your everything working well but a little bit of practice and you can get everything working great if you're interested in using the different dip pens to do the calligraphy. So when I did the eggplant one, I used um, two styles of lettering, a Romans and a copper plate. Look at this one, the one I was just doing. You can trace my lettering and make sure it's straight. I usually use some uh, pencil lines that I will erase afterwards to try and get it nice and straight. And then get a really thin brush, so a number one or even smaller with a lovely, lovely point or a pen. I just, you know, an ordinary um, pen, colored pen. And then very carefully make sure everything's dry. And, you know, great thing to do. Let me, let me be correct with doing this a great thing to do is to have something to protect your paper while you lean because you're going to have to really lean to do this with your hand and so often i will get paint all over my painting when i do that and with the very point of your brush and a small brush you can carefully go over the letters that you've traced And you can do the writing with a paintbrush if you want to put writing on there. Now this is a this is my number two brush. You could use even smaller. You could use a number one or a zero. And while the paint's wet, you can thicken up. Just thicken up some of the lines because copper plate has thick and thin lines to the the script and we don't have to be totally precise with this this is a painting i'm going to try it with an even um smaller brush in a minute and see which is best So you can put your lines on thin and then you can thicken them up where you would naturally have your pen going thick. Sometimes at the end of a flourish like this, you might have a little oval blob or a little dot. I'm going to switch to a much smaller brush. I have one that's a triple zero and see how that is. for the, the lettering. Sometimes when they're very small, they're a little bit firmer too, so they're a little bit easier to control. This is my triple zero. And this is a sable one too, so holds lots of paint, which makes it a little bit easier, so I'm not gonna run out of paint as I'm going along, which is not helpful. The good thing is when you do it this way, you can use the colors that you have used in the painting. So it really matches your painting. And I have a box of pens here. I have a box of pens here. They're um, Sharpie pens and different ones in all different colors. So if you're feeling like the paintbrush is way too difficult to manage, um, you could get yourself a thin pen. Now, this, these are actually, I picked up the Sharpies I picked up at the art store, but these ones I picked up at Dollarama. So um, let's just have a look at this one and see. Um, this is a Dollarama pen.
No, I'm gone. Gone through the paper here. So they're not bad. I'm going a little fast. But if you were feeling like the paintbrush is too hard to control, you can pick up these thin pens from Dollarama or a pack of pens or at one pen for a couple of two or three dollars, you can pick up uh, one pen from the art store and use a pen if you want to do it too. It's just that your color doesn't match as well, but that's okay. Um, I'll write my name in this dollar store pen down here. I think that's dry enough. And I think, I think the color matches the eggplant really quite well. This is, I think this pack of different color pens was uh, $4, maybe from Dollarama, maybe three. And there was a lot of different colors in there. And they're really nice, fine tip. So again, if you didn't want to mess up your painting with a paintbrush, then you could, you could definitely use a dollar store pen. This one, a little harder to use a dollar store pen because you couldn't get the two colors. But there are water-soluble pens that you could use, or you could just go between the lines that I've given you here. I get my, I get my um, raw sienna mix and start with, again, I should, I must remember to do this. Protect, protect your paper when you lay your, your arm down. You have to lay your arm down to get control but it's really good to protect your paper. So I've got my triple zero brush here with the raw sienna mix and I'll bring it up and put that inside the lines that I have with my pencil lines. And I'm going to switch to the green and just touch the green in there. A little bit of green touched here. Go back to my raw sienna mix. And it's kind of fun to paint inside your pencil lines with a little teeny brush. And it will look quite, quite authentic. Just switching, I'm switching back each time between raw sienna and the green mix. So I have both of them wet and wet. And you can pick up a tiny brush for hardly any money because they're so small. And even if it's just a, a polyester bristle or a you know man-made bristle, that's okay. It's even okay if it's it's an acrylic brush with a slightly firmer bristle because it'll make it easier to to control. You don't want the bristles too firm or they won't hold the watercolor paint but a lot of acrylic brushes are quite soft and they will hold the paint whilst being quite easy to maneuver uh, as you can see i'm going back and forth between the the green and the raw sienna And it does, it looks just like a pen when you're done. And this is why I didn't worry about this shadow going underneath, because if you go over the top of the shadow with darker paint, it's not going to be a problem. And the paint, the um, pen that I used on this, the C three nib that I used gives a kind of a broad stroke and then a thin stroke as you lift, you know, go up and down with the pen on an angle. So that's how you get these thin and thick strokes. And of course you can draw them just like we have here. My paint's getting a little bit too wet now. Has to be wet enough to, to mix wet and wet, but not so wet that it gets out of control on you.
probably when I edit this, I'll cut out a little bit of this fiddling around because it's maybe a bit too tedious to put in the final edit. And you may not want the words on your painting. I just kind of feel like they finish them up really nicely. Another way, if you're really feeling nervous about the calligraphy part, sometimes you can get stencils of letters and even in like the Dollarama and places, and you could actually stencil your letters out in pencil first before filling them up with paint. So that's another idea that could be helpful if you wanted the calligraphy, but you don't feel very um, adept at it. Let's pull back a little bit. Let's zoom out a little bit. So I've got that one there. And I'm going to go back to my my pack of pens here and let's see if we've got a we've got a green one from the dollar store these sharpie ones are really nice because they are colored and they're also waterproof and they they even come in like pastel colors now they come in a lovely range i've got some sparkly ones i don't know maybe the sharpies are a bit thicker i'm just going to I'm going to sign my name in this one just to see. Oh, it's not too thick. I really like having a selection of colored, colored pens that you can just pick up and use for different things. And it, you know, just to buy a pack of colored Sharpies and a pack of these ones from the Dollar Army, you're not expending too much money and they really last a long time. This, this lovely Sharpie, this lovely color, pastel -y color. Oh, where I'm, I'm pretty much done my paintings. Um, and of course, it always is really helpful if you put them on a nice um, dark background. It really makes them pop and you can use them then for a card or you can use them as a little... Um, you can frame them. What I like to actually in my kitchen, I have three of them all framed like side by side because I kind of like to have fruit and vegetable pictures and stuff in the kitchen. So it's another little idea or a gift for people. So, but always like think about having a nice dark card on the background so that they re it really makes them pop and stand out. And of course, when they're nice and dry, you can remove your tape. To get um, these ones don't have much of a background, so you don't really get a, a nice crisp edge on the outside. But they come out nice and flat if you have your tape on, and nice and clean looking. And and then you can put them on some nice dark card to make them pop. The eggplant could go on a, a purple card or a blue card, nice dark purple, nice dark blue. But if you want to have them all together, it's nice to have them all with the same same color background. Oh, I hope I hope your vegetables are turning out okay. Uh, we won't be here next week, but the week after we'll be doing a dragonfly or dragonflies, depending on which one you want to do. And I've got some beautiful photographs off of a site on Facebook. It's free photographs for artists. So uh, beautiful dragonfly photographs and that we're going to use next week. I'll send you a selection of the dragonfly photographs and you can choose which one you want to do or which two that you want to do. So that'll be up to you. I hope your eggplant and your avocado turned out really well. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you again in two weeks and we'll be back doing a dragonfly next time. So thank you for joining me. Happy painting, everyone.